This video has been supported by Skillshare. Hey guys, is anyone still out there? The prophecies were right, and the end is near. The end of my huge calibrator repair and maintenance thing. It's now passing the self-diagnostics and the self-check programs without errors. All that's left to do are a few preventive capacitor replacements. Mm, a few hundred of them, let's be real. It's still not quite done is what I'm trying to say, so this video will just be a few random bits that didn't make it into their own videos. First, I bought a huge flash lamp based yak laser, which along with a few of its accessories is currently residing in my bedroom. I don't even know what for precisely, but at least I'm prepared when the next huge flash lamp based yak laser opportunity comes along. Because replacement flash lamps are hard to get these days, and a comparable output power can be had in much smaller units, it was cheap. Scrap metal cheap almost. And sure enough, this entire assembly is basically a beautiful aluminium optical bench. So even if I'm not going to operate it the way it was meant to be, it's definitely a great foundation for future laser fun. Oh, here's another reason why nobody else wanted it. This is its control cabinet, responsible for generating and storing the high voltage and water cooling. If I converted the whole thing to diode pumping, this could be shrunk by a factor of 100. Now that's one hell of a circuit board. Would be a shame to shrink it honestly. This is the first product for video review thingy I've accepted in months. I used to do those all the time. But somehow the cross-section of things that I would enjoy filming these days, and the things that are generally being offered, is getting pretty small. Well, the Celpic at least looked like fun. It's a mobile inkjet printer. Or maybe it should be called a cartridge driver. Because what you do is insert the knockoff HP45 cartridge into the mostly empty handpiece. All the driver has to do is give correctly timed control signals to the cartridge. And just like that, practically all surfaces can be printed on. That's what their marketing material made it look like. And sure, for the very specific task of slapping a lot of equal markings on things that don't fit into printers, it's really nice. But the process of transferring new data to it is cumbersome to say the least. You turn it on and wait for it to start its Wi-Fi network. You have to register with an email address to be able to use the manufacturer's smartphone app. It also asks for location permissions for no apparent reason. It's not because of Bluetooth, I think. I wish it was, because this manual Wi-Fi switching is mighty inconvenient. The app itself is okay, except for a few minor details. Like it applied an edge detection filter to my logo here, which I didn't ask for but that's easy to correct, I'm sure. The material compatibility is, as they claim, very good. Plastics, metals, paper and cardboard, and even skin if it's somewhat flat. I've been vandalizing things with this printer for over a month now, and I didn't have to recharge the battery yet. Unless you're really going to soak pages by printing out novels, the ink is also going to last forever. One more thing I'd like to complain about though. The cartridge has little heaters built in that vaporize ink in the nozzles. That way microscopic ink droplets are sneezed out in a very controlled fashion. But can you guess what happens when that doesn't happen for a day or two? Of course it's going to dry out and some of the nozzles will cease to operate. In that case you've got to soak the cartridge's business end in IPA, ultrasonic clean it or gently warm it up with hot air. Inkjet printers prevent that to some extent with rubber cups at their end stops. 
The Selpik manufacturer is also trying that, but their rubber cup was completely ineffective in my experience. The solution is to store the cartridge in its original bracket. That way I kept one fresh for well over a week. This is interesting to me, because after understanding how these bubble jet cartridges work, it seems entirely possible to repurpose them and make them dispense other aqueous or alcoholic solutions. It's been done before, of course, but hello, inkjet 3D printer, how awesome would that be? Remember this guy? Single-handedly started my Chinese advertising career back in the day. Good old TS-100 65W soldering iron, powered via DC barrel jack. Except not really. This is a USB-C 60W 20V power delivery dev kit. Certain laptop or Latte Panda Alpha chargers would also be able to do this. But not necessarily TS-80 compatible quick charge power banks. Those can't source 60W. Which is what many have criticized about the TS-80 when it came out. So to combine the advantages of both irons and to incorporate state-of-the-art power delivery, Jan Henrik has designed a drop-in replacement mainboard. Open sourced it completely and sent two to me. Thank you very much, the result is beautiful and much more powerful than quick charge TS-80 can be. Only the availability of 60 watt capable power banks is pretty limited still, but I have a feeling that'll change soon. Manual assembly of all the miniature SMD components was a bit difficult, but I think the design is mostly JLC PCB assembly service optimized. So if you want one, you can avoid most of this by giving them the design files. I had to do it myself and redo it a few times over as you might be able to tell from the scrubbed off black paint on those SMD resistors. This is a very important part, an STUSB 4500. It negotiates power delivery profiles with the power source and conveniently it defaults to 20V all on its own. So with it it's actually incredibly easy to have all sorts of things powered by USB-C PD. It can do more than that, so the I squared C pins are connected. But currently, I don't think anything is implemented in software yet. The OLED display and the tip holders are borrowed from a regular TS100. The board fits perfectly into the standard enclosure, but the micro USB cutout had to be opened up a bit to accommodate USB C. There are apparently also some fuse holders that can function as these tip clips. But those are usually tinned, so I suspect their thermocouple reading performance isn't going to be quite as good. Alright, now we only need to find a place to test drive it. If only I had a big electronic repair project somewhere. Oh, by the way, insider info here. There's an e-design birthday coming up this week, and maybe a new old soldering iron announcement of their own soon after. Maybe send them some love on Twitter if you too enjoy their uniquely awesome stuff. Since I just mentioned tin plating and thermocouple reading performance, here's how the modified Solartron is doing. Over the course of 12 hours, its reading stays within roughly 3 microvolt, that corresponds to half a ppm, and that corresponds to a much better result than I would have hoped for, since the readings start falling in the evening, only to rise back up again in the morning, I'd say that what little change we are seeing is caused by ambient temperature, so no big deal. For this measurement I had screwed the silver plated copper cable straight into the new low thermal binding posts. That's better than having an unknown metal test lead in there. But it's far from ideal. Real metrology grade test leads have these solid copper spade lugs, which are naturally nowhere to be found. Except I only just discovered this German supplier who's also selling other interesting cables and accessories. 
and naturally I couldn't resist purchasing a set of 20. Those are a little bit expensive, but they tick many boxes. They are made for small cable diameters and they don't have a lot of thermal mass, so that they adapt to temperature changes rapidly. Before discovering these I've tried many alternatives. And based on the fact that the most promising results came from boiling regular tinned copper lugs in hydrochloric acid, one can tell that none of them are viable. Very viable though for many tasks other than low thermal EMF connectors. A hydraulic crimping press. This makes it easy to apply enough squeeze to a crimp to deform the individual wires in a cable and to almost cold weld them together. What is any your opinion? The press cost about as much as 20 of those nice spade connectors by the way. Very happy with both purchases. I was actually unable to see anything, so I dipped the crimp in ferric chloride for a few minutes. Now one can barely make out some octagonal wire shapes. Since we've woken up the CNC machine now, we might as well have a quick look at a few new exhibits for that. A Patreon member has sent over indexable end mills in 10 and 12 mm diameters. Cute! I didn't even know that those existed in such small sizes. Still, even 12 mm is usually too large for ER16 collet chucks. But after some persistent digging in the darkest corners of eBay, I found this strange oversized 12 mm ER16 collet. I think I've shown this luxury hand wheel before. Nothing comes close to its build quality. Custom spring detent mechanism for the encoder wheel, metallic knobs, a real hardwired emergency off switch, illuminated buttons, display and all that kind of stuff. That was donated by friends along with some other artifacts that I also haven't processed yet. But I did start to get serious with this one. It doesn't look particularly complicated, it's just a bunch of buttons connected to an 8090 CAN microcontroller. That's an 8-bit AVR, but with some additional hardware for a CAN bus. There's even a standard AVR JTAG programming header. So I connected a programmer to it and actually found a nice and unlocked binary image. Including some readable plain text strings even. Now ideally I'd like to find out what kind of commands this thing sends and expects over the CAN bus so that ultimately I don't have to erase that microcontroller and write my own button checking and display writing firmware from scratch. That would be weeks of work, I'm sure. But that's about as far as I got with that, because I found this thing on Banggood. It's nowhere near as nice as the other one. It makes a connection with this musical wireless USB stick, which is kind of convenient but insufficient for any kind of high reliability emergency off situation. The reason why I got it is because there is an almost working driver in the machine kit project. And thanks to Tala83 on YouTube, it's set up and configured for Linux CNC in half an hour. This is so nice. Whenever touching off in tight spaces I previously had to try and get as close as possible with computer keyboard in hand. Which usually amounted to middle of the room then. I only hope this thing doesn't have a failure mode where it rapid fires a lot of 10mm movement commands. So far, all good, down to the last micrometer. Also interesting, I've installed Linux CNC on our old friend the Lata Panda Alpha. It has some real-time jitter, so it's not a particularly good candidate, generally speaking. But that stack of backhoff modules on the left makes that less of a problem. After compiling some special software, Linux CNC can talk Ethercat to it via a normal Ethernet cable. 
And now all of these wonderful GPIO pins are available to have functions assigned to them, like limit switch inputs. There is no motion controller in this stack, no step generators and no PIDs. So a Mesa card is still way more powerful and a lot cheaper too. But what I'm most interested in is the slice on the right, the can open interface. My servo drives happen to speak can open too, so theoretically I could replace all of these ugly parallel cables and the primitive step direction interfaces with a nice and modern serial bus. That's kind of my excuse why I haven't cleaned up this mess yet. Or maybe I'm just saving that whole digital servo interface idea for the wire EDM machine, which is slowly beginning to accumulate in this corner. Okay, that's all I had on my procrastination shelf. We'll be back with the usual more focused videos soon. Until then, check out Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers a membership with meaning. There is a lot to explore there, real projects to create and a community to be a part of. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life, so you can move your creative journey forward without putting life on hold. You can learn and grow with short classes that fit even the busiest of routines, like Adobe Photoshop Essentials with Daniel Scott. The short practical examples that he's presenting are a fantastic foundation to mastering this sophisticated piece of software. With an annual subscription costing less than $10 a month, Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. The first 500 to sign up with the link in the video description are getting two months of premium membership for free. So give it a try and explore your creativity. Thank you for watching.